This is WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security news each week. I'm your host, Corey, and this is the episode for the week starting July 9th, 2012. This was a very busy week for security news, and for time's sake, I can't cover all the stories I'd like to this week. That said, if you're interested in any of the stories I quickly glaze over or that I'm skipping in this week's video, be sure to check out the reference section of the WatchGuard Security Center blog post associated with this video, where I'll post links to some of the missing stories this week. With that out of the way, let's jump right in with the first story this week, which of course, being the second Tuesday of the week, is Microsoft Patch Day and the many other software-related updates uh, released this week. I don't want to cover any of these updates in any detail. You can go to some of our WatchGuard Security Center posts to learn more about them, but let me list some of the software you do have to patch. Uh, first of all, it was Microsoft Patch Day on Tuesday, and Microsoft released patches for Windows, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, their SharePoint server, and Internet Explorer. So if you have any of those products, be sure to patch them. Also, if you're a Google Chrome user, uh, Chrome released version 20, which fixes three security vulnerabilities. Uh, Google releases Chrome updates quite regularly. Chrome should auto-update for you, but nonetheless, you might want to make sure you have the latest Chrome update. Finally, if you use any of Cisco's telepresence products, these are products that allow you to do video conferencing over networks. Uh, Cisco did release security advisories fixing many vulnerabilities in their telepresence products, so be sure to update those products as well. Next up this week is another raft of password database leaks. You probably remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the big LinkedIn password database disclosure breach. This was where an attacker uploaded a bunch of LinkedIn credentials to get a bunch of other hackers to help him crack those credentials. Well, this week it's happened to two more companies. The first is Formspring, a lesser known social network, and the second is Yahoo themselves. Earlier in the week, Formspring disabled about 30 million of their user accounts after they saw hackers basically leaking hundreds of thousands of credentials for their users. I think they said something like 420,000 user credentials were leaked. Uh, so if you're a Formspring user, you definitely change your password. On top of that, later in the week, uh, a hacking group calling themselves Deeds with two threes uh, posted to a forum a bunch of Yahoo passwords, anywhere from 400 to 450 thousand different sets of passwords and credentials. Uh, so this was a big deal as well. Now the Yahoo leak is a little less is known about it. It seems to be somehow related to Yahoo Voice, uh, one of their voice over IP services. And uh, a lot of people say these may be older passwords. According to one researcher, only less than 5% of the actual uploaded credentials really work. Nonetheless, these are both very big password breaches and they show you how important your password is on Online. If you remember all the advice I gave you back in the LinkedIn days, it holds true for this. If you're a member of either of those sites, definitely change your password. More importantly, you need to be using a different password on every single website you use, and I highly recommend you use a password manager to manage all these different credentials. Next up, let's talk about some interesting malware campaigns. Earlier in the week, researchers at F-Secure discovered some web-based malware that was very interesting. Essentially, the malware used some special script to try to detect what operating system various victims visiting this malicious website were using. It then would deliver a payload customized for whatever OS it detected, whether that be Windows, a Macintosh OS X, or even a Linux system. So this is a very, very interesting advanced technique. Now, we have seen web-based malware in the past that tried to detect what browser you used so that it could deliver the proper exploit for your browser. But this is one of the first times we've seen it looking for particular operating systems to deliver the right kind of malware. Now, in more interesting news, later in the week, a researcher from Trusted Security mentioned that the actual source code these malware authors were using was his own actual proof of concept source code for his penetration testing framework. Essentially, a source code he gives to other security 
security researchers for detecting operating systems via a browser. So it's very interesting to see malware authors actually using tools that security researchers are making public. And this particular code can be used by anyone. It's very public and it's out there. So there's two takeaways to this story. First, do know that criminal attackers are getting more advanced in their techniques. They're taking code that they're finding anywhere from security researchers, from other advanced persistent threats, and incorporating it into their criminal malware to make it even better. And more importantly, you have to realize no matter what operating system you use, you can be vulnerable to attack. The days where only Windows PCs are targeted are long gone. Nowadays, there are plenty of vulnerabilities on Macintosh OS X computers, and even Linux computers have vulnerabilities as well. So no matter what operating system you use, you should make sure to patch and harden it, and you should also use security controls like local host-based security software and security devices like our XTM and XCS appliance. The second interesting malware variant was a new Android threat with a new delivery twist. Researchers discovered some new Android malware on Google's official Google Play Marketplace. Uh, the malware posed as a normal game app, and when you first download the application, it looked very, very benign. However, the new delivery twist was Google actually allows Android applications to get remote updates after they've been downloaded on a device. And that's exactly what this particular malware does. Once it gets on your device, Device, it goes to a remote server and downloads new code and basically the payload code that turns this application into malware. I believe this actual malware actually then dials some pay to call numbers and generates incomes for the criminals. This interesting delivery mechanism looks like it's there to evade Google's bouncer. A bouncer is a new automated system that Google recently put on Google Play to scan their marketplace for malicious applications. Now of course because Google allows their applications to get remote updates, this particular delivery mechanism allows the malware author to deliver his malicious payload after it's already been downloaded, which is a big, big problem. So what does this mean to you? Two things. First, if you download games from Google Play on your Android device, you might want to make sure you haven't accidentally downloaded this Trojan application. Second, if you're using an Android device, you need to put anti-malware software on it. Right now, attackers are starting to target mobile devices, especially Android devices. Android devices seem to have a lot of malware going after them these days, so I highly recommend you use anti-malware software on all your Android uh, phones and tablets. The final story this week is an unpatched vulnerability in Windows Vista and Windows 7's gadget components. If you've heard of gadget, this is the system that allows you to have little background applications on your desktop. Things like clocks and weather apps and little RSS feeds that just sit on your desktop for quick informational usage. During patch day, Microsoft also quietly released a security advisory describing a new flaw in this gadget component. Essentially, if an attacker can get you to download download and install a malicious gadget file, he could leverage this flaw to execute arbitrary code on your system, potentially gaining full control of it. Now, unlike some of their other security advisories where an attacker is already exploiting this in the wild, Microsoft seems to have found out about this flaw first. However, it still remains technically unpatched. They haven't released a full patch for it. Until Microsoft releases a patch, you have two options. First, they have released a fix-it workaround. This is kind of a temporary patch that kind of mitigates the issue, so you can definitely go and install that. Your other option is simply to disable gadgets totally. If you don't use them in Vista or Windows 7, feel free to disable them. I might also point out that our XTM and XCS appliances can also help. Both these appliances have capabilities of filtering certain content over the web, email, or FTP, or many other mediums as well. Gadget files typically come down as a .gadget extension or as a MIME type called Application X Windows Gadget. And using our security appliances, you can actually specifically block this particular content, thus preventing any gadget files from reaching your network. And it's a great temporary way to mitigate this particular flaw until Microsoft comes out with a patch. As soon as they do, we'll be sure to inform you in one of our WatchGuard security blog posts. So that covers another week of security news. Thanks for watching. And remember, if you're interested in any of the stories I skipped or glazed over this week, be sure to check the reference section of the WatchGuard Security Center post associated with this video. You can also uh, follow the WatchGuard Security Center blog just to keep appraised of the latest security stories every week. And don't forget, if you want to get up-to-date tweets on security news, be sure to follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. 
As usual, thanks for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Thank <laughs> you.